Good evening. Good to see everyone this evening. We are continuing our study of great themes. And for the next two weeks, which would be the last two weeks of this quarter, we're going to be studying uh, the idea of end times. And if you uh, have paid any attention at all to what's going on around us in the religious world, you know that there's confusion about the end of time. And we're going to tackle uh, two aspects of that uh, uh, tonight, really, in a sense, we're tackling two together because they do go together, the rapture and the tribulation. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll go and we'll study Matthew chapter 24. And when we look at Matthew 24, you're going, to, you're going to hear things that you hear all the time. And people will be telling you, oh, these verses mean that the end of the world's coming. Well, no, they don't. And we're, we'll see that uh, as we go through. Uh, I'm going to start this class by giving a definition and then telling you some, some ways that the false teachers uh, approach this subject. We will not look at the verses initially. I'm going to tell you what they use. And then we're going to go to the verses and talk about what the verses mean and things like that instead of, of what they're said to mean. So... The rapture uh, is defined by Hal Lindsey and C.C. C. Carlson in the book called The Late Great Planet Earth. They say it is to snatch away or to take out. Uh, and then we find an interesting quote from Hal Lindsey, who's theoretically the expert uh, for the denominational world in this field. Here's what he says. It is not found in the Bible. So there's no need to race for your concordance. So here we've got a doctrine that the chief proponent of it says, you won't find it in the Bible. You can't find that word in the Bible. Well, that, that might be understandable, but it's not going to be. We'll, we'll see that as we go on through. One other quote, this is from uh, Lindsay in the uh, Terminal Generation. I believe the Bible teaches that just preceding the last seven years of history, before Jesus Christ returns to this earth, he's going to mysteriously and secretly snatch out all those who believe in him personally. And that, that is his description, essentially, of what they call the rapture. All right, the Schofield Reference Bible that I now reference in the, in the next slide is the, it is the study Bible of premillennialists. It's been that way for years. Uh, interesting enough, I would mention it from time to time in classes early, you know, when I came here. And uh, you, you all remember Lazarus Watson. Lazarus came up to me one day and he said, do you have one of those? And I said, no. And he said, well, I do. Would you like to have it? And I said, absolutely, I'd like to have it. Uh, because I can quote from it. And it's their writings. It's, it's not me uh, building a straw man. Instead, it is, it's telling you exactly what they teach. So here's what the Schofield uh, Reference Bible says on Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. The Great Tribulation is the period of unexampled trouble predicted in the passages cited under that head from Psalm 2.5 to Revelation 7.14 and described in Revelation uh, 1118, involving, in a measure, the whole earth, Revelation 3.10. It is yet distinctively the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, and its vortex, Jerusalem, and the Holy, Holy Land. Now, by the way, if you've studied the book of Jeremiah, you know he's wrong. He's dead wrong. Uh, the vortex of Jerusalem's problems was uh, happened in uh, the early... Uh, well, 500s, that's a hard way to say it, because early is like uh, 586, you know, and late would be 500. <laughs> uh, so but early 500 B.C., by about 586, when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem. And that's what Jeremiah's talking about. It's clear as a bell when you read the book that that's what he's talking about. But Schofield does not say that. What scriptures are supposed to support the rapture? And these will be the scriptures we'll look at in just a little bit. As support for the rapture, 
1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 5 through 18 are cited, and that's in the terminal generation. There's also a cursory reference to John 14, 1 through 4, and a clear quotation from Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now, what I've done here is I've done the reading, I've dissected it for you, I'm giving you what they say in a synopsis. If you want to look it up, find that book, find that page, you'll find it. It's, I, I've not mistreated them in any sense. The rapture is to precede seven years of tribulation, according to Matthew 24, 21, 22. Now, next week we'll talk about that, not this week. Immediately followed by Christ returning to earth to reign for a thousand years. And again, all that's coming from the terminal generation by Hal Lindsey. By the way, uh, if you want to check this out, uh, Jeremiah prophesies that God says no descendant of David will ever rule in Jerusalem and prosper. None of them. And Jesus is the descendant of David. So that creates a real problem. Or more especially, he's a descendant of a guy named Jeconiah or Coniah, depending on uh, where you're reading in Scripture, and both those names are used. The next slide is a chart that I thought you might find interesting. It outlines essentially dispensational premillennialism. Now, why do I specify that? Because uh, premillennialism has different uh, forms that it takes. This is the dominant form today. This is the one that you'll find most of your religious neighbors if they believe in the rapture and tribulation, this is what they will go to. All right. So now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to start to dissect the verses that they say supports uh, the rapture and the tribulation. Uh, so let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For the corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. One thing that you may want to, uh, at least in your mind and maybe in your notes, and even if, if you tend to write in your Bible like I do, you may want to circle trumpet. Because trumpet occurs very often in references to the second coming of Christ. you got the trump sounding in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll look at that in a few minutes. you got the trump sounding again being mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And of course it's mentioned here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Invariably, uh, the trumpet sounds when Jesus is coming back to take his church, his kingdom, and deliver it to the Father. And that's talked about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 very thoroughly. These verses then actually come in a context of discussion of the resurrection, of the res resurrection of the saints. Of course, first talking about Jesus, but then uh, also uh, <clears throat> everybody else, the saints that will follow him. Fleshly bodies have no place in heaven. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> the Apostle Peter writes it this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, watch it, incorruptible, and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Key word, incorruptible. Now let me ask you a simple question. Is your current physical body incorruptible? What about it, Bob? No. And I didn't, I'm not picking on Bob, but Bob and I are old enough, I'm not as old as he is, but I'm headed there. We're old enough to know this old body wears out. It's corruptible. It, it breaks down over time. So heaven doesn't have corruptible bodies. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that extensively. And so to talk about being raised to go to this, uh, this place in a fleshly body, 
that won't work. It simply will not work, uh, biblically speaking. Paul was revealing something long concealed when he said all believers would die a, that not all believers would die a physical death. In other words, some people are, are going, going to be raised uh, when they're still alive. Now, we're going to look more at that in First Thessalonians chapter 4, <coughs> where the dead in Christ will rise first, but then the living will also be raised. See, so some people are not going to have to die, but they're still going to go to the judgment. They're going to be part of the resurrection. But their body <clears throat> will change. That's what Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 15, that they will be changed from a corruptible body, that's this body, to an incorruptible body because it's going to an incorruptible place, a place called heaven. And that's what we want to especially notice as we go along. First, the apostles said, the trumpet will blow. Second, the dead will be raised with incorruptible bodies. Third, those saints still alive will be changed and go to heaven. All must change. You can't go to heaven with a fleshly body. All right? With the change of bodies at the resurrection, death's power over man will be gone. You know, I've, we've talked about this before in some of our teachings. Uh, you've got to get the context to understand anything. And the best way to do that is when they cite, in this case, three or four verses, you want to read the verses before and the verses after so that you can get it in the proper context and understand it completely. And so let's read a little bit further in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're now picking up at verse 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then should be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, death will be swallowed up in this powerful moment. And please note, that's death, that's period. There's not going to be anybody else dying after this point. Not physical death. They may die a spiritual death, and we'll talk about that at another point, but they're not going to die a physical death any longer. Paul actually uses a loose quotation of Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. Uh, and Paul joyously and triumphantly declared the resurrection to be the end of death and the fear that it holds for mankind. It's kind of interesting to look at his words there when he says, O oh, death, where is your sting? Uh, death is here described as a serpent, and, the ser and sin is its bite, and the condemnation of sin is in law is its power. In other words, the poison in our sin would be under the law of Moses because we can't escape it. Under the law of Moses, you can't get rid of it. You know, it's kind of like the fellow that gets the venom in him and there's nobody to extract it from him or to give him an anti-venom, anything like that. Well, our anti-venom is what? It's Jesus Christ. And particularly the blood of of Jesus Christ. That's our anti-venom to overcome the sting, as it were, of, of sin. All right, now turn to the next passage they use, and that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I've got to, it got to tell you, when I read these books by Hal Lindsey and came to the realization that he likes to use 1 Thessalonians 4, I thought, this guy's crazy. He's using, he's using the very passages that will destroy his own argument, you know, and, and they do. So let's look at these uh, together. I want to look at the fuller context. So we're going to start at verse 13 as we look at this. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now, pause a minute. Falling asleep, that's a euphemism. 
Okay, what's a euphemism? It's kind of a, it's a nice way of saying something people don't want to talk about. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I have. As a preacher, uh, I'm, I'm around a lot when people have someone die. Do you know how rare it is that someone says, uh, he died? This very morning, I got a call from a preacher in Virginia. Uh, I was very close, in some ways, to his father-in-law, who is an elder in the church in, uh, <clears throat> in the Richmond, Virginia area, well, Mechanicsville, actually, uh, Virginia area. And he told me, in regard to his father-in-law, that former elder, he said, he's gone. Not he's dead, he's gone. We don't like to say somebody's dead. We'll say they passed. They're asleep. That's, by the way, that's the biblical word most often. They're asleep is a word that is used. But we, it's a euphemism. It's just a nice way of saying it is all that we're talking about here. So think about it that way. All right, verse 14. <clears throat> For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, <clears throat> that we who are alive and reign to the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, Comfort one another with these words. All right. We want to look at several words here uh, that, that, would, that may help us. First of all, Paul didn't want them to sorrow. Does that mean Christians can't be sorrowful when, when a Christian loved one dies? No. The word that he uses here is, is, a, is a present tense verb, and it doesn't matter that you remember that. But what does matter is that that means it's ongoing. It's linear. It never stops. A Christian in the death of another Christian should not always be sorrowful for it. Sorrowful? Yes. But not forever. You know, it doesn't keep on keeping on. Why? Because, because of what Paul says. We know where they're going. We know what's going to happen for them. It's, it's a blessing. So that's a word we need to understand. Uh, then further, the sleep was the euphemism. We looked at that. The word coming here is a word that you may have bumped into. In fact, I think, I want to be careful, one of the major series of novels that was written supposedly about the end of time, supposedly based on Scripture, is called the parousia. That's this word. And the word parousia is the coming of an important leader or deity. So we could call, one thing you could call the coming of the king, any king, an earthly king, you could call that a parousia. You could call it that. Because that's the meaning of the word that is used there. The word uh, shout here is used exactly one time in all of Scripture. This is it. Right here. Uh, I didn't say one time ever in Greek. It's used one time in Scripture, and that's here. What does it mean? It is a word of command. It is a mutual cheer, hence in the New Testament, a loud shout, an arousing outcry. Jesus is going to come with a shout, and it's like, you know, all I can imagine... Well, let me, let me see. I'll give you an awful, but the best parallel I can get on earth. Teresa and I, a number of years ago, were invited uh, by a, a, a guy that, uh, that worked a, a broad area. Uh, he'd been given four tickets to the Tennessee Titans football game. And we went. Well, one th we found out real quick, you've got to get there really early if you want a parking place anywhere close to that stadium. We didn't get there early. I mean, we were a little early, but not a lot early. So as we kind of hustled down the road there, trying to get to the stadium, you could tell that the kickoff had come. 
because it was just a giant roar, you know, went up, went up from that stadium. Okay. To them, it's, it's the roar of, oh boy, we're here. It's great. It's wonderful. Well, that's what Jesus is going to do. He's coming with a, a roar of command, a shout. It's, it's, I'm here. We've defeated death. You're overcoming it, is the idea that is being put here. And very powerful, you know, when you think about it uh, in, the, in those terms. And then he's got the words caught up. And those words are written in such a way as to indicate divine power. Not caught up by, by any other means. Divine power catches them up. And then the word meat is very reminiscent of, guess what? It's the same word that's used in the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew chapter 25, verse 6, when it says that the wise virgins, remember, they went out to meet the bridegroom. Same word. Identical word. Uh, and it very appropriately, because this is the bridegroom coming. This is Jesus coming uh, for his own. So, <clears throat> quickly, the fuller context of First Thessalonians 4 shows Paul did not want to leave them in doubt or sorrow because of ignorance. Unbelievers are burdened with an extra amount of sorrow, seeing no escape from death. I have in my office a copy of a, uh, a, of a book that was written by Robert Ingersoll. Ingersoll was a leading atheist uh, years ago. He and his, his brother was also an atheist. And they had a pact with one another. Whichever one dies first, the other one's going to speak at his funeral. Why? Well, what's the preacher going to say? <laughs> you know, uh, here's a guy who doesn't believe in God. Here's a guy who doesn't believe in heaven. He doesn't believe in any life after the grave. And so what's the preacher going to say? Well, he ain't going to say much anything, you know, to be honest about it. So as, you know, time passed by, Ingersoll, Robert Ingersoll's brother died first. His funeral eulogy is in that book. And I have read it. I'm not, I didn't bring an exact quote for you tonight, but I'm going to give you the essence of it. As he stood over the grave of his brother, he said something like this. We long to hear a voice from the lips of the quiet dead. That it's all right beyond. Beyond what? You're an atheist. You don't believe in any beyond. And that was the problem. Even he was haunted by that. Well, Christians don't have to be haunted. We know about the beyond because Scripture has talked to us about it, and it does even here. Instead, the Apostle Paul intended to reassure them so they could comfort one another. Verse 18, Paul did not describe a mysterious and secret snatching away of the saints. By the way, Revelation chapter 1 is very clear. Every eye will see him. Every eye. He hadn't come like that. <laughs> I'm not saying he won't come. He will like that. But he hadn't yet because every eye hadn't seen him. The Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. Keep circling trumpet, because it's in all these verses every time we start talking about it. So now go to 2 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, it appears to me, let's remember something. In Acts chapter 17, Paul goes to the city of Thessalonica for the first time. He has success in the preaching of the gospel with some people. But the Jews that rejected the gospel were, drove Paul out of town. He didn't get to stay very long at all. So it appears to, to me, and most people I think would agree that have studied it very thoroughly, that the book of 1 Thessalonians was written very shortly after Paul left. And why is it written? Because they didn't know everything they needed to know. And so here they were, Paul had taught them about Jesus, he taught them about the resurrection, and they were, they were longing for it, they were looking forward to it, they were being tormented by, by persecutors, and they experienced all of that, and so they're wondering about it, and they're crying, because some of the Christians died and Jesus hadn't come back yet, and they thought, uh-oh, they're going to miss out. 
They're not going to get to be a part of the resurrection. So Paul writes them in 1 Thessalonians to correct that understanding. Here's the problem. Sometimes people take a piece of information and they extrapolate and come up with the wrong, with the wrong end over here. See, so he tells them there's going to be a great resurrection. So what conclusion do they reach? Oh, me. We're going to, have to spend eternity with those people that have been tormenting us. We're going to have to spend eternity with our persecutors. That's what they thought. So Paul writes 2 Thessalonians. So now listen to 2 Thessalonians in that light. And I want, I want to begin to pick up uh, with verse... Let's read verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. In other words, they're going to get what they gave. You know, what, if they gave you trouble, Jesus is coming to give them trouble. All right, now, now he explains it, beginning verse 7. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. All right, first of all, the word troubled here is the word thlibo. And the word thlibo in the original language describes being squeezed like a grape. You ever felt like you were in so much pressure that somebody was squeezing the juice out of you? <laughs> Well, that's the word. That is the word. They're being persecuted in Thessalonica to the point they feel that way. They feel like the, that the, the, the juices of their life are just being squeezed out. So that's the word here that he uses. So then he says, verse 8, <clears throat> he's going to re be revealed as mighty angels. That's the end of verse 7. Verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, please notice, when we look back to the first book, to 1 Thessalonians, that Jesus is going to descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The archangel is a leader of a, a group of angels. So it is a surprise to you that in the second book, that he talks about a great group of angels being with Jesus. He's talking about the same thing. He's talking about exactly the same thing. Only this time they're going to punish two types of people. Those who do not know God. In Scripture, the word know does not mean I met them. And sometimes I say, do you know so-and-so? Well, yeah, I met him. <laughs> if that's what you mean, I met him. That's not the way Scripture uses the word know. In Scripture, the word know means come into an intimate relationship with. Now, it's not always sexual, though it can be. Think about Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare a son. Well, that sounds pretty intimate to me. Okay. But it's not always talking about sexual. It can be talking about just a close, intimate relationship. I've, I've got that relationship with some of my dear friends, and I'm sure you do too, you know, where you really know them. You know, I, I can tell you, I'll just give you an example, because he and I worked together for several years at the school. How does Jody Apple eat? He eats a big meal at lunch and nothing else all day long. How do I know that? I'm close to him. I know him. He knows me. How does Gary eat all day long? <laughs> when Jody's not eating, I'm eating. <laughs> that's, just, that's just pretty much it. But we know each other. You know, I know how he'll react to things. He knows how I'll react to things. Teresa knows me far better than that. You know, she's been with me you know, more than 49 years. And you all can send her sympathy cards. It's okay. But, uh, but uh, you know, she knows, she knows how I will react to certain things. Because she knows me. We have an intimate relationship. How are you going to come in an intimate relationship with God? No, not God. Well, I propose to you there's nothing more intimate than being added to the church. Because remember, the Savior added to the church. That's Acts 2.47. The church is the body of Christ. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. And so, Jesus Christ is the Son of God... And if I'm a part of the body of the Son of God, isn't that a pretty intimate relationship with God? 
I'd say it is. I'm as close to God as I can get as a human being. I know him. So those that know not God are people that never obey the gospel. Could Atheists would be in the category, but they're not alone. It's anybody that didn't obey. Anybody. And then he says, those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And somebody says, ah, see, that's Paul using a Hebrew technique called parallelism. And that's when you, that's where you got to be careful, because sometimes if you're like me, you can know so much that you don't know anything. Uh, yes, Hebrews do use parallelism. There's no doubt about that. But this is not parallelism, because the word that he uses there, uh, obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, is, guess what, a linear verb. It's one of those ongoing verbs. It's present in nature. And so what he's saying is, those who do not keep on obeying. Do you know that one verse, if you understand it correctly, destroys the doctrine of once saved, always saved? Do not keep on obeying. You see, those are people that are going to be condemned, according to what Paul writes right here. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So these are going to be punished. How are they going to be punished? Well, listen to him. These should be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. They're never again going to be in the presence of Jesus. They'll never again see his glory. Why? They're going to hell. I mean, I'm trying to be nice, but that's, that's what he's saying. But now, what about the Christians? See, we've kind of left them out now for a short time. Pick up at verse 10. When he comes, watch it, in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. You, uh, the word translated glorified there is passive. Now, why is passive important? Well, in a passive activity, I didn't do it. Somebody did it to me. If I go to Drew, and Drew will tell you I don't work this way. I do get fillings. I have had pretty rare, but I do. Uh, but if I go to Drew and he says, you need a filling, uh, if I receive a shot, guess what? I'm passive. The point is, I don't give it to myself. Drew's got kind of an interesting technique. I've watched him use it with Teresa. You know, he, he somehow or other you know, makes it easier to receive the injection. Uh, I don't fully understand it, but I saw it. You know, I, I kind of know what he's doing there. Okay, well, you're passive if you get that shot. You don't give it to yourself. So you're passive. So what about this? When Jesus comes, we're going to be glorified but we're passive in that. In other words, God's going to do the glorifying. Jesus is going to do the glorifying, not me. He's going to glorify you and me as Christians by taking us home to heaven. That's the idea that Paul is setting forth here. So let's go back and I'll read some of these ideas that I, that I wrote in trying to respond to, to these fellows. Those who had given tribulation to the saints would receive the same from the Lord when he comes. Notice it in that day. I love the word that day. That appears multiple times. We'll see it next week in Matthew chapter 24. He comes to be glorified in his saints, to be admired among all those who believe. Now watch. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Jesus says everybody's going to be raised in the same hour. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming to which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. They have done good in the resurrection of life. They have done evil under the resurrection of condemnation. Everybody's going to be raised. Same hour. All of us are going to be raised. And we need to understand that. So that's John chapter 5 enforces that. Paul talks about it on occasion, uh, as do other writers, but more especially uh, Jesus and Paul are the two, uh, two that bring, bring that out. Jesus here says everybody's raised the same hour. Now that destroys premillennialism. See, because they've got a resurrection of the righteous, nobody knows about it, secret, you know, mysterious, which by the way, Scripture doesn't support. But hey, they told us it's not in Scripture, so that ought, that ought not surprise us. 
And then seven years later, they got another resurrection. And then, then after a thousand years, they got another one that comes in some people's estimation. That's not biblical. Jesus said everybody's going to be raised the same hour. John chapter 5, 28 and 29. Everybody, same hour. So, so that destroys their argument, leaves it, leaves it wanting greatly. Uh, Christ spoke of tribulation in Matthew 24. I'm not going to elaborate on that right now uh, in great depth because we're going to come back to it. Uh, but, but notice when he does say that, he says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Have you ever read the book of Acts? Does it not seem like that they were hated? They brought Peter and John before the council in Acts 4. They brought all the apostles before the council in Acts chapter 5. Herod killed James in Acts chapter 12. He threw Peter into prison, Acts chapter 12. They tried to kill Paul in Jerusalem in Acts 21. And, and then when, he, when the Romans intervened and saved him, uh, they, this 40 of them made a pact and said, we're not going to eat again until we kill Paul. And if it hadn't been for Paul's nephew who found out about it, well, found out about it and told Paul, and then Paul had him tell the centurion, if it hadn't been for that, he'd been killed right there in Jerusalem. Do you think they hated them? I don't have any doubt about it. Jesus said they were going to hate, hate them, and that's exactly what takes place. Uh, we're going to talk more about this signal to flee uh, next week when we get to uh, Matthew 24, but I want, I want you to notice verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. Daniel talks about desolation twice. Once in Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, the second time in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, Luke explains it, and here's how he explains it. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, that's the desolation coming. Who surrounded Jerusalem with, ar with armies? The Romans did. What general was in charge? A fellow by the name of Titus? was in charge. He came up on Jerusalem. He put a siege up against her. And then there was trouble back home. Vespasian was in trouble. And so he withdrew his troops. He pulled back from Jerusalem, thinking he'd have to go to Rome to help Vespasian, the, at that time the, the Caesar, if you would. And when everything he found out everything's okay in Rome, here he came again. Now, a fellow by the name of Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, tells us historically what happened. When Jerusalem was surrounded by armies, all the Christians knew what Jesus had said. All of them. They knew that's the abomination of desolation, because Luke had told about it very clearly. Luke 20, 21, I believe it is. That's why I had that. 2120 written down here for you. And so when Titus withdrew his army, guess what happened? This is according to Josephus, Jewish historian. All the Christians left town. All of them. There were a million people, according to historians, a million people were killed in Jerusalem when the Romans finally crushed the town. How many Christians? Josephus says, Zero. Why? They listen to the Lord. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you get your chance, get out of town. I'm putting it in my words, but that's the idea. And they did. That's exactly what they did. And most interesting. Now, let me ask you a simple question. If this is the end of the world, why would Jesus say flee? Can you run away from the end of the world? No. You cannot run away from the end of the world. There's no way to do that. It's all going to be burned up. All going to be dissolved. The elements be melted with fervent heat. That's what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, 
Uh, pick up at verse 10 and run toward the end of the chapter. So you can't run from that. There's no way. But Jesus is saying, run! He's not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about the end of Jerusalem. She's done. As a, as a, a system, of a, a civic system, a civil system, done, finished, through. Jesus, instead of calming the fears of the disciples by reassuring them about the coming rapture, speaks of a need for haste. And we're going to look at this next week, but he, t- he talks about various things that will indicate you need to, you need to run. They need to run and run quickly. Uh, <clears throat> so why would he tell them to hurry, get away from that which they would never endure? If they were going to be raptured up, they don't need to run, do they? No, let everybody else suffer with it. But the Lord says, run. (laughs) And I mean, he's pretty clear about it. Don't go back to the house and get anything out of the house. Don't get a thing. Get out of there. You're going to be destroyed. That's the idea uh, that is set forth. Uh, Again, Matthew 24. And like I say, next week, we're going to elaborate on this pretty heavily. So I'm going to skip from that. I want to look about Christ cannot reign. Look with me, if you will, to close out this class, Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah chapter 22. This is God speaking about Jeconiah. And here's what he says about Jeconiah. Jeremiah chapter 22, beginning in verse 28. Is this man, Coniah, a despised, broken idol, a vessel in which is no pleasure? Why are they cast out, he and his descendants, and cast into a land which they do not know? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless. Now, wait a minute. Did you notice... In the verse we already read, verse 28 and 29, especially 28, he talks about he and his descendants. He's not childless. he got descendants. So there's got to be another way to understand this. Let's keep reading. The context will tell us what he's talking about. A man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. They'll never do it. Now turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, you all know this is the lineage of Christ. In fact, verse 1 says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Then he begins. It goes down through all the people that are his great, 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 great grandpa, and so forth. Watch when he gets to, uh, on down in that series of verses, to verse 12. Well, we'll look at 11 and 12. And Josiah begat Jeconiah and his brothers. By the way, Jeconiah's other Old Testament name is Coniah, which we just read about. Jeconiah and his brothers, about the time they were carried away to Babylon, and after, after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. Guess where we're headed? Read on down. <clears throat> Zerubbabel begot Abiud, Abiud begot Eliakim, Eliakim begot Azor, Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, Achim begot Eliud, Eliud begot Eliezer, Eliezer begot Matthan, Matthan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Is Jesus a descendant of Jeconiah? You can nod your head this way. He is. Can Jesus ever, ever rule in Jerusalem and prosper? No. How's he going to be ruling for a thousand years in Jerusalem? He's not. Let me put it to you this way, and I mean everything I'm about to say. If Jesus comes to earth and rules on the throne of David in Judah, God is a liar. 
Now, I don't believe God lies. Do you? Jesus will never rule in Jerusalem. Next week, Matthew 24, Lord willing.
announcement sheets, check your bulletins. Also, Malcolm Barnett, let's, let's keep him especially in our prayers as he's dealing with, the, with health, with his health. Uh, Zach Shears, he's no longer in a coma. He had surgery on his femur, both hips, uh, past Friday, and he's, he's still in ICU. He still has a long recovery ahead, uh, but let's continue to remember him and their family in our prayers. And also, Nancy, Nancy Wright, she's dealing with some health issues. Uh, keep the granddaughter of Jimmy and Mary Barr, Anna Taylor, in her prayers. She's having knee surgery tomorrow, so let's pray for her and the family and those looking after her. Also, Andy, Dana, and Derek as they, uh, will soon be traveling back from Fiji and uh, in their work that they've done there. Also, David Nelson is a preacher in the church in da Dasher, Georgia. He's in the hospital and he's dealing with some health issues there, so let's remember him and the family in our prayers. And also, Heather Nettles is, is, uh, will be uh, marrying uh, Jeffrey Hall here recently, uh, soon, and let's remember them in our prayers as they uh, get on their journey of, of being married together. Uh, work projects. Saturday, uh, Hiram says uh, he's needing some help, but because of the rain, they're going to do some work on Thursday and Friday evenings, and they're planning on moving the metal shed in the back back there, so he needs some help. If you can help him, please let him know. Also, the Fall Festival will be Saturday the 29th from 6 to 8. If you'd like to help, please sign up in the, on the list in the foyer. See column, column for details. In the event of a rain, the Fall Festival will be moved inside the building. Eating and games will take place in the upstairs fellowship hall, and the doorways in A and B wing hallways will be used for the trick-or-treating. Uh, and you can look for the updates that will be sent out on Ringham. Last the later, sixth grade and under, Bible will practice Thursday night at 6 p.m. at the home of Drew in Morgan Dulaney. And on Sunday, October the 30th, starting at 3 o'clock here, here at the building, we'll have um, Bible Bowl, Scripture reading, speech, and song leading practices for the youth. The Teen TNT on November the 1st will be the home of Gary and Teresa Hampton. And uh, kids' projects will be November the 5th, so see Colin for that. Women to Word, November the 7th. Uh, the ladies will begin their new study on 1st and 2nd Peter. Uh, Team Blast Night, November the 9th, the Sonic and the Clinton. And the Golden Circle will have lunch November the 13th. And the men standing in the gap will be November the 14th. There will be a ladies' retreat January the 27th through the 29th, and any lady who plans to attend needs to turn in their registration money as soon as possible uh, to secure a spot. And if you got any questions, talk to Hannah Broom about that. If you will, bow with me and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful again for today. We're thankful for each and every day that you uh, allow us to be alive, Father, that you've given us the good health that we have in our family, in our homes, in our jobs, and just so many things that you give us. But most of all, for your son and for the death that he died and coming here and paying a price for our sins, Father, and redeeming us from from the, the curse of sin, Father, and we just are so grateful for that, grateful for the love and mercy that you showed to us by sending him here, Father, and we just pray that you'll help us as we serve you and glorify you. Please be with uh, those that we just mentioned with Zach Shears and Nancy Wright, Anna Taylor, and David Nelson, Father, and be with them and help them as they're going through these health issues and Malcolm Barnett and all of our other brothers and sisters that that are sick and suffering and having problems and lost loved ones. We just pray for them all, Father. We pray again for Andy and Dana and Derek and, and the work that they're doing there in Fiji. And we pray for their safe return home, Father. We pray that you'll be with us all and help us as we serve, serve you and glorify you and forgive us of our sins. And thank you again for your love. In Christ's name we pray. The invitation song tonight will be number 21, if you want to mark in a book, number 21. We'll sing that after the devotional tonight, and before we'll sing 589. 589, and we'll sing verses 1 and 3. To Christ be loyal and be true. Yeah. 
Good evening. I'm going to be looking uh, briefly at one little snatch of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I know we looked at that Bible class. We're going to look at something a little different. So uh, don't don't uh, go to sleep on me. We've got, we got some good things, I think, to talk about. Why do you like Thanksgiving? Some folks are going to say, well, I like football. That's why I like Thanksgiving. Lots of football games. There's pro football or college games that go on. You know, it, it's just football. Other people say, oh, it's the food. Man, it's the food. Let me tell you. You don't have a better, better spread of food in the whole year than you do for Thanksgiving. How about I give you a different reason? Reunion. Reunion. My growing up years, I remember Thanksgiving as a time when, uh, when a good group of the Hampton family got together. Grandma always fixed the turkey and dressing. She had a recipe all her own. Nobody knew what it was. She made it every year. People asked her, how do you do that? She said, I don't know. I just do this and that and the other. And it always turned out good, I can tell you that. But it wasn't the food, it was the people. It was being with grandma and grandpa. It was being with cousins and aunts and uncles and so, so forth. That's what it was all about, was reunion. Did you know that Paul talks about reunion for Christians? I want you to think about all the people. If you had your way tonight and you could enjoy being in this auditorium to the fullest, who all would you like to have here? I can name a bunch of names. They're, they're gone all by myself. And I've only been here a little over 10 years. Some of you have been here by, probably since Belvedere began. Can you name some names? I think you can. Well, listen to this verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we'll pick up at verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are, who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now watch it. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. You know the worst thing about Thanksgiving? Only last one day. Or maybe if you stay for the whole weekend, last four days. But then so. You're not going to be with that group of people probably again for another year. Did you hear what he said? We're going, the dead in Christ are going to be raised. All those people you may have thought about that used to sit in these pews. All those people, if they were faithful in the Lord when they died, they're going to be raised first. And if we're still living, we're going to be raised. We're going to meet them in the air. And then what? We'll always be with the Lord. We'll always be there. So what should be our goal? Our goal should be to be ready, either one, to go to sleep in Jesus, that is to die a Christian, or number two, for Jesus to come back and find me a Christian, faithfully serving one or the other. And so tonight, all we ask you is, are you a faithful Christian? Some of us started out that way, but we stumbled. What are you going to do about it? Well, John says, confess, 1 John 1, 9. And James effectively says the same thing, James chapter 5, verse 16. We can get it straight. We can get it right. But then what about those who are outside of Christ? Well, you need to be in Christ so that you can be part of, the, of those that are raised and meet each other and have a great reunion for eternity where we all get to be together. 
The way you do that is you're buried with Christ in penance and baptism. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. You thereby are set free from your sins. You become part of the Savior. You're added to the church. And the Lord is ready to take you home. If you want to know the greatest reunion that has ever been known, you need to be sure you're faithful to the Lord. If you're not, make it change now. Come while we say it. Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way. shining light and an example. Lord, I pray that we can reach out to others, that we can tell others about you, tell our, tell our friends and families about you.